Dr. James Bochi is going to introduce Dr. Rani. And I just want you to know how special this man and physician is. He's been the chair of Yoga Moves MS for like six years now. He didn't know what he was getting himself into when he started, but he's been a major um, important part of our growth, our leadership and our planning. Thank you so much, Dr. Bochi, for being here today. Thank you, Mindy. Um... And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, and Mindy, thank you for putting together a great collection of speakers. It's been wonderful so far. And uh, we're going to now have three uh, very special neurologists coming up in for the next, next half. Um, and these are both people who have really advanced the care of neurology, both locally as well as nationally and internationally. Our first is Dr. Rani Aburashad, uh, who has served as the chief of neurology and the director of the Multiple Sclerosis Center at the Memorial Institute for Neurosciences and MS. He holds a clinical faculty position at Central Michigan University and serves as the medical director for specialty care at Memorial Hospital. His center is designated as an MS or comprehensive MS center by the National MS Society, which is a very coveted uh, achievement. He has lectured on various aspects of multiple sclerosis, both nationally and internationally. He's published numerous articles and abstracts surrounding MS therapeutics, as well as on progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy and different autoimmune disorders of the uh, central nervous system. His research team is currently focused on the role of blood biomarkers as measures of predictive change in multiple sclerosis, something we've been desperate to have. He was the first in the US to use neurofilament light chain measurements amongst other markers in real world MS patients. He served as principal investigator for numerous phase one, two, and three clinical trials in multiple sclerosis. He's uh, received numerous awards, including the Richard Alper Memorial Award, the Michigan Medical School Grant Award, and our very own Yoga Moves MS Leadership Award in 2018. His presentation today will be neurofilament light chain and the role of biosignatures in multiple sclerosis. And Rani, thank you for being here. Go ahead. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Dr. Voci. So I first want to say thank you to Dr. Voci. Those of you who don't know, he's 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 being a little bit humble in terms of uh, well, he didn't really say much, but Mindy Mindy kind of downplayed him. So uh, Dr. Voci uh, has been in no way. Yeah, no, you didn't downplay him, but I do want people to understand. So Dr. Voci is an incredibly busy person and and someone who uh, takes a lot of time out of his life to do this, um, and he's passionate about it, and it 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 you know emanates and everything that he does with it. So uh, I, I wanna give him a, a direct thank you from me for everything he does. And in addition to that, I do wanna thank Mindy and the Yoga Moves MS team um, for putting this on because it's pretty remarkable when you look at where people are from. I went through all your names and kind of, you know, I've been reading, you know, the chat box throughout the day and people are from all over the place, which is just incredible when you think about it because uh, these virtual things have become tedious, I think, and, and this is just an outstanding group. So thank you for that. Mindy, should I give a talk? Yeah, you should give a talk. All right, let's give a talk. You're, you're really good at it too. Well, we'll see what we can do. So uh, uh, if you can get my slides up, that'd be great. All right, so uh, thank you everyone. Welcome, my name is Randy. Um, I know many of you and um, I see many of my patients' names in this little participant box. So to all of you, I, I would call you all out individually and say hello, but I can't, but uh, hello to you all. So I, I'm excited to speak to you guys about something that I'm very passionate about. and. Um, it's gonna probably um, probably resonate, I think, with with the group in terms of what we're trying to do, um, and uh, we've been working on this very diligently uh, since May of last year. Uh, COVID slowed us a little bit, but we've had some recent advancements that have been really, really fun to kind of watch and uh, uh, have kept me up many nights. But at the same time, it's just you know you're kind of trudging step by step closer. So uh, I'm gonna talk about neurofilament light as well as uh, kind of the newer uh, protocols that we're using, looking at biosignatures directly. So with that, I'll begin. Do I advance or do you, Mindy? I do. Perfect. All right. So uh, what is neurofilament light? So one of the questions that I've always asked in terms of uh, MS as I've gone through this, and, <clears throat> and one of the challenges that I've always struggled with um, has been really, you know, is what I'm doing correct? Uh, when you think about MS, you know, I think as a patient, sometimes you kind of have an inclination that your doctor knows exactly what they're doing. And this may come as a shock to many of you, but many docs 
don't know entirely what they're doing. They know a lot of the science behind it, but in terms of, you know, this is entirely the right decision, uh, I think it takes a lot of intellectual honesty to know that uh, we don't always have all the answers. And so when you, when you understand that fully, um, uh, you kind of can begin the process of trying to answer questions within yourself and within your practice and within, within a certain disease state. And so for the, for the last really 10 years, that's been an interest of mine because I always found it interesting. I'd, I'd go to a meeting and there'd be 15 you know, world experts and no one agreed on anything. And, and I said, well, that just tells you we don't know. And, and so with that, I, I, me and my team have really focused entirely on trying to get that objective answer, trying to, to provide information to the greater world in terms of this is the right step for a patient. And, um, and, and so that led us to uh, looking at blood biomarkers. So let's start with what that means. So a blood biomarker essentially is an additive feature when we're trying to determine what a patient's multiple sclerosis is, not from a diagnostic standpoint. So I already diagnose you based on MRI and based on your symptoms. So let's say I have your diagnosis. A blood biomarker is a way for me to see the unseen, a way for me to foreshadow your disorder and to assess kind of where you may be in 10 years, where you may be in 15 years, and then to hopefully apply a change now before any of that damage occurs that can positively impact or bring down that level of disability. So uh, the idea here is, uh, you know, I'll use cancer as an example because I think it fits really well. You know, if I were to test your blood uh, for, you know, a certain marker and I were able to say, oh, you have this very tiny cancer, but it's not going to do anything. It's not going to worsen. It's not going to spread. It's not going to, it's going to, it's going to remain benign the whole time. That approach from for, for you as a patient mentally is very different than me saying you have this cancer and I have no idea if it's going to be horrible or if it's going to remain benign forever. Cause now I've changed your life entirely. I've altered your entire psychological mindset. Um, and for the rest of your life, you will wake up day by day wondering if today is the day that the cancer gets severe or, or spreads. And so, my goal is to answer those questions first. And then once I'm able to answer it, then be able to say, all right, you have this cancer based on this blood test. And it's a cancer that concerns me a little bit. So I'm going to zap it now before it ever gets worse. Right? So in the situation like that, I'm ahead of the cancer. I'm, I'm, I'm basically preemptively treating. So when you look at multiple sclerosis in this particular room, out of the couple hundred people that are here, there are people who, live entirely normal lives for the most part, maybe occasional bad days. And there are people who are in wheelchairs and have severe spasticity, severe pain, urinary changes. So you have this breadth of, of patient care. Um, and in that patient who's doing entirely well, uh, who has no symptoms uh, and no disability versus that patient who ended up in a wheelchair, there's everything in between. And so looking at blood is much more detail oriented than looking at someone's MRI. So the MRI is very useful to predict your case. However, it has a ton of limitations. And Dr. Voci and the other clinicians on this on this cast on this webcast can you know attest to this. So we've focused entirely on a marker that we believe gives us a lot of information uh, very early in the disease. And that marker is something called neurofilament light. And if you look at this uh, this picture that uh, we developed uh, last year. Um, this kind of begins the process of understanding it. So when you look at a nerve cell specifically, uh, all of you are familiar. Uh, can you see my arrow, Mindy, when I move it? No? I do not see an arrow moving. Okay. There, might be, there might be a way. Hold on. I think I have a way. Um, I may not, but nonetheless. All right. I'm not going to waste too much time. So if you look at the purple in this, the purple sausages that you see here represent myelin. And every one of you is very familiar with myelin. You've been to a million talks. Um, and myelin is kind of the insulating coat. We see it coat. now. Okay. Well, that, that, that's someone else, but whoever's doing a good job, you're right, right where I want you. Um, so myelin serves as the insulating coat of your neurons. And every one of you knows that. Knows that. And underneath that myelin, is the actual axon which transmits information. So when you think about this in the brain, there's billions of these neurons and you have electrical signals that begin here, travel down the length of this 
axon and then synapse here at the end. And then they pass that information to another network that goes travel down and basically it's like, it's like handing off a ball, right? It's handing that electrical signal it's called an action potential. And it's just transmitting that information second by second, millisecond by millisecond, billions of times a day, right? So when I lift my right arm, all I'm doing is transmitting that information from the left frontal cortex and just rapidly bringing it into the arm. So that's all, it's this massive connection network that really is the most remarkable thing you can think of. Well, that axon is really the wire that transmits that information and the myelin allows that wire to move information much more quickly, right? So the, that myelin speeds up transmission. So in MS, all of you are familiar with something called demyelination, where you lose that outer covering and hence get slowed signals. Well, there's a lot more to it than just that because it's not just a demyelinating disease. So you can have the actual covering, the myelin get damaged alone in isolation. You can have the axon itself get damaged. Um, and you can have really the whole structure be transected in some cases when you talk about black holes where you have severe axonal loss. Well, underneath that, in the, in, in the internal part of the wire, there is this scaffold. And this scaffold is made up of five proteins, okay? That, those proteins, three of them, the most prominent parts are neurofilaments. So neurofilament heavy based on its molecular weight, neurofilament medium, and then neurofilament light. Neur neurofilament light is the most predominant of these proteins. And there's a couple other peptides in there as well. These proteins, what they do is they essentially hold up the axon. They make that wire a little bit bulkier and they increase really its surface area to allow it to transmit information across broader ranges or broader, broader breadths of, of, of areas. So if you have a wire that's very small, it goes you know, from point A to point B. Well, if you can expand that wire and stretch it as much as you can, it now expands its territory. The, the ability for it to kind of transmit information becomes more powerful and it becomes more efficient, right? So you want efficiency in the brain. You want quick information. Well, when you end up with damage uh, to the brain in any way where you have neuronal damage and say it can be a concussion where someone gets punched in the face uh, and the head goes through the shear injury or a multiple sclerosis plaque where TMB cells are attacking the brain, you end up with damage and you end up with leakage of these proteins. And you can kind of see that in the bottom of this diagram with the arrow here. Uh, these proteins start to leak into the spinal fluid, which is the blue part of this picture here. And eventually they leak into the brain, okay? So neurofilaments, and I want you to focus on neurofilament light, leaks after damage or when there's any ongoing damage into the spinal fluid and then later into the blood. If we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. When you think of multiple sclerosis, we have really dual processes that are occurring. So let's, let's hang on to that first image that we had in our head of that neurofilament leaking into the spinal fluid. Well, that can occur in a variety of ways, right? So in multiple sclerosis very early, this is a very inflammatory disease. So you see a ton of B and T cells rushing into the brain, attacking myelin, just chewing it piece by piece, right? And they're getting some of the axon too. So you're getting the wire and you're getting the covering, just chewing and chewing and chewing. And the neurofilaments are just leaking out, leaking out, leaking out, leaking out, right? Well, as you get older, this disease changes. And many of you in this room have had MRIs repeated over and over again. And your doctor says, oh, the MRI looks stable. The MRI looks stable. And you're like, but I'm not doing well, or I'm getting worse, or something's not right. Um, and the doctor kind of shrugs his shoulder or her shoulder and says, um, you know, well, based on the available data, you know, you're doing okay. And, and you know, we'll, we'll do a little something, see if we can get you better. Well, that's fine because that's the best that we have right now. However, there's also an underlying element to this where when you think of that picture that we had before with the myelin being chewed, don't think of MS only as B and T cells attacking myelin. Also understand that once you develop this disease, once you have those inflammatory cells occur, some of those cells remain trapped underneath and they, so, they slowly leak into the actual cord okay, into the actual, uh, excuse me, into the actual wire, so underneath the axon. And they slowly degrade kind of internally that scaffold. So that picture, that, that mindset that I told you about the axon where it's, you know, a very thin wire has very thin information, one-to-one. -one. However, if you can broaden that wire, it gives it more, more density and more surface area. Well, everything can look perfectly great in your multiple sclerosis from an MRI standpoint. However, underneath here, you might be having you know, slow chewing, microglial chewing of that protein. 
And that little area starts to shrink a little bit. And it's shrinking slowly over time as you get older. And eventually what happens is you're getting slowly worse, right? Because those neurofilaments are being chewed up and the axon in terms become le becomes less efficient. So when you think of MS, I want you to picture two things. One is the direct obvious inflammation on the exterior of the nerve cell. And then two is the more concerning part, which is that slow axonal loss over time, that slow atrophy. Um, if we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. So we can see a great example of this here. So on the left side of this uh, picture, you see an MRI with kind of the classic multiple sclerosis T2 hyperintense lesions, right? And these are located in, in classic areas of the brain. So uh, um, on the, if you see those two ponds, God, I wish I had a little hand thing. Um, can you move the hand, whoever's moving the hand for me? Bring it over here, left, left, left. Okay, so go to the white area on the first picture. First picture, okay, so those two white areas, that little butterfly you see there, that little butterfly is actually where the spinal fluid is, okay? So those are the ventricles and they look black on the further right image because it's just a different sequence. We're just using a different filter, right? Nonetheless, that's where the fluid in the brain lives and it kind of circulates downwards into the spinal canal. Well, around that area is kind of a classic territory for multiple sclerosis lesions. And you see these classic ovoid white lesions that are very obvious in the picture on the left. And that's just inflammation, demyelination, destruction of tissue around there. And uh, the second picture shows you another area that's commonly affected called the perivenular area. So in this one, the black part there you see underneath that white uh, lesion, that, that, that little black thing is the same ventricle that I showed you on the first picture. That's where the fluid is, but above it is brain. And so you're getting brain, you're getting demyelination there. Well, if you go to the right, the right picture completely, let's go to the right picture entirely. This doesn't, you don't see many white lesions on this, right? I think everyone can agree that the picture on the left looks very different than the picture on the right. However, what you do notice is the ponds start, or excuse me, the, those ponds, those ventricles start to enlarge, okay? That enlargement is actually atrophy. It's shrinkage of the brain. And so this is actually the same patient. And this is an MRI done in five-year intervals over a 15-year period. So the picture on the left was their brain in the beginning. Uh, no, no, scratch that. Get rid of the, the picture on the left of the right image. So A, picture A was at the baseline. Picture B was, and this one is actually seven and a half years later. And then picture C was seven and a half years after that. So 15 years later. And you can see the striking difference in how much atrophy this patient has. So this patient's brain has shrunk significantly in terms of in the last 15 years, but you don't see a ton of white lesions surrounding it, right? So classically that demyelination is those white, people ask me all the time, how many lesions do I have? And I really don't care, to be honest with you. It doesn't matter to me how many lesions you have. That's not the fight I need to win. I can win that fight. We've gotten very good at, I mean, trust me, it matters. I'm not trying to downgrade it, but I can win that fight. Those lesions tell me if I have good control of the inflammatory component of your disease. The bigger question, the bigger goal for me is can I stop your brain from shrinking? Because if I can stop it from shrinking, I can potentially stop you from worsening and give your brain a chance to slowly improve over time. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And yes, Lindsay, that's a ton of brain loss. I agree. So to help understand this further, we've developed a model that we call the neural foundational model. And this is, a, as I, I built this model for patients because a, you know, a, it's something that I think I want patients to understand what we're trying to do in our research because I think it helps you as a patient if you're, in, if you're part of our research. So let's look, at, let's look at the model of a neuron as a home, okay? So on the left in, in panel A, that's a normal home. So what you see here is you see the roof of the house, and that roof represents myelin. You see the house itself, and that represents the axon, right? That represents that wire. And then underneath that house, you see the foundation of the home. So in, in a normal home, that would be the concrete slab, okay? And so that would be a normal structure of a neuron. If you go to panel B, you see that, you, let's say you get an MRI on panel B. An MRI on panel B is gonna show me white lesions everywhere because this patient's roof is on fire there is demyelination occurring, correct? So this patient has an active MS attack. Uh, film A and B, um, are, are, excuse me, uh, uh, B and T cells are attacking the roof and they're actually causing this to be on fire. Now on an MRI here, I'm probably gonna call Dr. Voci and say, man, this guy's brain's on fire. 
we need to put the fire out, right? Well, if you notice on film B, it may look horrible, but when a fire occurs, yes, there is scarring. However, you can repair, you know, damaged paint and you can replace a roof. Um, you can actually improve that. But what you'll notice is there's a little bit of a crack in the foundation in panel B. So yes, there is a little bit of leakage of that concrete, of that neurofilament level. So let's say I draw this patient's blood at the time of this attack. They've got this horrible MRI that looks really bad, but they have very small leakage of neurofilament. The foundation of the home remains intact. And because that foundation remains intact, I know that I can probably stabilize and improve this person. Okay. Uh, and I will answer your question shortly, Catherine, about the spinal cord. Um, so, so because this person's concrete slab is intact, I know that we can actually bring this, you know, bring this home back to its normal or at least as close to normal as possible. Okay. Now let's look at panel C. This can be another MS patient who has a severe attack that actually transects the entire home. So the roof is damaged, the myelin is chewed up, the axon is damaged significantly, and then the concrete slab is damaged as well. And these, this person, I draw their blood, their neurofilament level is gonna be incredibly high because there is damage to all three structures and especially damage to the concrete. That's the part that I, that's the part I really wanna hold on to, that I need to preserve as best I can, right? And then the one that bothers me the most is number D, right, number D, letter D, sorry. Um, so D represents that insidious slow progression that's occurring in an MS patient. And many of you have this. And so I want you to pay attention to this for a second. The insidious slow progression occurs because of those trapped cells that I mentioned earlier, right? And I believe they're microglial cells. So um, those cells, it's like having a flood underneath a house. So I get the MRI and I say the MRI looks stable. However, underneath that MRI, in an area that we can't pick up on the MRI, is this slow flooding, and it's causing neurofilaments to leak into the spinal fluid and into the blood. So I can measure that patient's NFL, and I can actually see an elevation in that level significantly, suggesting that whatever I'm doing isn't enough yet, or, isn't, or I'm not able to get to the crux of their problem. Um, and I'm going to answer two of the questions while I'm on this slide, and then keep going. So one of the questions was um, about the spinal cord. So how does this apply to the spinal cord lesions that have never gone away? So the first thing I want to tell you, lesions, for the most part, will never go away in the majority of patients, okay? So just because you have chronic lesions is not a reason to panic or worry. Most MS patients will have lesions from 15 years ago they never knew about, and we'll see them forever. So the idea of getting rid of a lesion itself is not a goal that should be in your mind. If it happens, absolutely amazing. We love it. And I do see that on occasion. If that lesion is active, okay, if that lesion is actively inflamed, yes, we want that activity to go away. We will still see the scar, but we want that activity to go away. So pay close attention to this. Every one of you who has MS will have some lesions in the brain and probably in the spinal cord, at least 40% of you in the spinal cord as well, okay? Those lesions are like looking at your MS from 10,000 feet. And it's just giving, it's, it's like looking at the Battle of Gettysburg from above, okay? 10 years later. You can see damaged soil. You can see blood stains. This is a terrible analogy, but it works. You can see the areas where horses have trampled but the war is not active right now. The war is done, okay? But yes, I can see kind of the playing field and how it looked. Those shouldn't make you panic. If I look down there and I see active war, if I see inflammation from gadolinium, that dye that we put in your, in your vein when we get an MRI, if I see that inflammation, that's a different discussion entirely. My goal is to stop that inflammation, get another MRI, and make sure that all I see is a battlefield and no active war. When it comes to the spinal cord, the spinal cord is made up of exactly the same tissue that I discussed in the brain. All of it is neurons. So this, this what I'm describing to you, this model, fits entirely into any spinal lesion as well. So it represents the same thing. And then somebody asked, how do we stop brain loss? And that was a, you know, that was a great question. And I'm going to try to answer that towards the end of this. So let's keep going from there. Next slide, please. Okay, so what have we found? So when we first started neurofilament, and just so many of you understand, this is an entirely new kind of discipline. So um, <clears throat> this has been 
this isn't easy. There's no playbook to what we're doing. And um, it's been a labor of love, a labor of frustration, a labor of amazement, or, or amazement and, and we continue to kind of grow in it. And now it's gotten to the point where it's getting very exciting, at least to me, and, and it's fantastic. And I'll kind of, I'll end with what that means. Um, so when we first started, we didn't even know what normal levels were, right? So everyone's brain is constantly aging, no matter who we are. We're like cars, right? You never have a new car. Your car is never as new as it is today, right? And your brain is the same way. So as the, as the age, I mean, as we age, we normally are going to have uh, shrinkage of the brain. And that shrinkage of the brain uh, is, going to, is going to actually cause leakage of neurofilament. So the first thing we wanted to do was look at what's normal. You know, what is the effect of age on neurofilaments? Because uh, an 18 year old's brain is gonna atrophy or shrink much differently than a 70 year old's brain. So the first thing we did was we, we got as much data as we could and, and you can see the numbers in the middle there. So really everything was relatively stable until mid 50, okay? Once you get into the mid 50s, really 52, 53, you start to see a slight elevation in neurofilament just in, 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 for normal. So for all of us out there, don't freak out about that, that's normal. Um, but we do see a slight elevation. So it went up to 12 in that population. Once you jump to 60, it jumps up pretty significantly, jumped up four picograms per deciliter. And then once you get to 70, it really makes a jump and so on and so forth. So we really have five and a half decades of life where the brain does a pretty good job of self-preservation. Okay. And we needed to understand this to apply this to multiple sclerosis, because my goal with this is that when I see patient A in front of me, that I am individually treating that patient entirely. So I'm not speaking in broad strokes of this is kind of what I do with patients. No, what I want to do, what I want to get to is to a point where I say, hey, patient A, here are your numbers. These numbers concern me because of, or these numbers give me reassurance because of, and we're gonna apply the following treatment, even if it's risky because we have to, or I don't wanna take risk in you because I don't need to at this stage. That is the end goal of what we're trying to do. So go ahead to the next slide, please. So once we established this age idea, the next step we wanted to know is, does it mean anything? Like, do these numbers mean anything? Because remember, I'm, this is like finding a new island, right? When you get on a new island, you see these species out there that you've never seen and you're trying to describe them. So we have this number, we have this arbitrary number that we're getting off of our machine and um, really no one has a good handle on what it means. So the next step was to try to figure out if it actually means something meaningful. So for example, if you have a neurofilament level that is 30 versus 10, does it make a difference in terms of how you look, right? And the answer was a glaring yes. So this actually was a very joyous day for us in the clinic when we had this. When, when, we, when we crunched these numbers, it was really an important day for us because we had some data in retrospective trials um, on this that suggested it. But to me, this was essential. I needed to know that when we're looking at these markers that we're actually gonna be able to see a correlation and a prediction that may matter because then if I intervene and work this number as aggressively as possible, in theory, it should change kind of how a patient's doing. So what we did to assess that was a couple of things. One was a nine hole peg test, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And if you're in our clinic, we do this on you every time you come in. Um, and this nine hole peg test is very simple and it just basically gives us an idea of your dexterity in your hands right? We want to know how well your hands are moving, how quickly they are, and it gives us an idea of how fast you are. So we have you take these pegs, put them into the nine pegs, uh, into the nine holes, and then take them out one by one. And then we time you. And we have data on our, for our patients, we have databases with all your information. So uh, before I see you, I'm looking at 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. And I'm tracking that. I'm seeing kind of what that number is doing. Is it trending downward? Now, this is important for you to understand. As a patient, you may not notice the subtle change. So if you have a 20% change in your speed, you might not pick up on that in your day-to-day -day because you're not doing fine motor activity every day. So it doesn't affect your ability to use your phone. It doesn't affect your ability to, you know, you know use, use a, a, like a uh, remote control or something. So, so I can pick up on that slightly earlier. And, and the neurofilament level that a patient had 
was very predictive of that, which was a huge thing because it, it, it meant something, at least clinically, I believe it means something. So go ahead to the next slide. So we tested that. And then we tested something called the 25 foot time walk, which is something that again, our patients are gonna get this every time you come in. And, and for most of the clinicians on here, they're gonna do them on everybody they see. And this is very important because the idea here is how fast are you able to move? In isolation, this means very little to me. So if I were to meet you today, check your 25 foot time walk, I'm not gonna really care what it is. Whether it's three seconds or eight seconds, it is what it is. That's just where you are in space, right? However, if it's eight seconds today, and I see you six months later and it's 12 seconds. And I see you six months later and it's 13 seconds, right? That is a negative trend in terms of your ambulation. So you're starting to slow down. You're starting to kind of, you know, transiently have this, this, this degradation that's occurring in the background that you may not notice again, because who the heck times themselves walking, right? Unless you're an athlete who uses an Apple watch and says, I run six minute miles. Um, you know, most people don't do that on a day, on a day to day basis. So, uh, so we wanted to look at 25 foot time walk. We wanted to look at the nine hole peg test, two very objective functional measures. And we wanted to look at neurofilament levels at various points as we measured these patients. And we continue to do this in our population. So our study is five years. So we're in year two of five right now. And we'll, and we have data that we will submit throughout this. However, clearly the neurofilament levels that we were seeing in our patients were correlating very closely and very and relatively accurately with the timed walk as well as the nine hole peg test, especially when we took out age as a factor. So we needed to correct for age, obviously, because if I take an 80 year old who doesn't have MS, he's gonna be slower with his hands than a 20 year old. So once we protect for age, we then look at 25 foot individually and nine hole peg individually. So, uh, and both of them showed a direct correlation with neurofilament levels. So go ahead, next slide, please. And so why does this matter? The last question that I wanted, that we wanted to answer was, all right, so we have these numbers and we want to assess whether the medications themselves can affect, affect these numbers in a meaningful way. So in this, so in shortly, you're going to hear from one of my buddies, Dr. Boster, who's, who's a phenomenal guy and a great lecturer and a fantastic clinician. And, and Aaron and I, are very similar in a lot of ways in terms of how we approach this disease. And, and I think that's kind of the basis of our friendship started with that is for years, we kind of were, were pounding the table um, behind the scenes about, I think some of the conservative approaches that, that, that many did. And I understand why people were conservative. Uh, however, we've kind of, you know, evolved now. And now you're starting to see the rest of the world understand why we were doing that. And now the data is showing that that's really the way to go. And the question I had was, all right, so I'm using these different drugs and you guys see all these drugs and there's more coming out. I mean, we've got 16 trials right now in our place that are going on for phase two or phase three stuff. There's so many drugs that are on the horizon. Um, and the question that we wanted, to, we wanted to answer was, all right, do the drugs actually make a difference? So when we look at patients who are on drug X, Y, or Z, or in this case, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, does it matter and does it have an effect on the neurofilament level? And the answer was absolutely. And you can see that here in this table. Now, I don't put the names of the medications in here. Um, that is on purpose. Um, I know what they are. And we continue to expand on this database. So as we get through this number and we start to kind of, you know, so one of the things for us that was huge, we had a lot of patients who came to us on, not on treatment. So you can see 163 cases we had in the, and this is old data. We now have much more than this, but 163 cases um, you know, were, were, were not on treatment when they came to us. So these are patients who had what we would call chronic multiple sclerosis. And the doctors who they were seeing said, oh, let's just take you off treatment entirely, or let's just, uh, you know, you're gonna be fine, the inflammation's gone. Well, their neurofilament levels clearly were significantly higher even when we correct for age. So there's no question that the treatment has a profound effect on the neurofilament levels. And when I, what I told you earlier about the nine hall peg test and the 25 foot time walk, it, you would, it would suggest that if we get that level as low as possible, hopefully it will change and slow down the progression of the walking and of the dexterity issues and of the cognitive issues and so on and so forth. So that was kind of the first chunk of research that we did between May of 2019 and, and this all continues as we speak between May of 2019 and now. However, there is another layer to this that I wanna to introduce to you today as I wrap up here and then take some questions if you have them. 
So now what we've done is really gone several steps further and it's been very exciting to see. And, and we are now in the process of working with um, some, some big people in terms of looking at a biosignature. So neurofilament, we know is a very big component. However, we also hypothesize and believe that there are several other proteins that when you add to the mix, so I draw your blood and I check your neurofilament level and I check protein A, B, and C. For us, it's a quadplex and we have two add-ons too that we're testing now. So it's six biomarkers. When you take those six biomarkers and you put them into kind of an algorithm, you start to see ratios and those ratios might be even more predictive in a patient um, uh, than the neuro, than neurofilament alone. And we believe that wholeheartedly. So that has been really our big focus right now. And we continue to, to finish protocols in this regard. And, and, and we've gotten funding for this, which is exciting. Um, but so, so the goal here is, can we come up with a biosignature for you as an individual patient based on the best available data? Can we take that biosignature and can we apply it to your case? Can we put you on a treatment or a therapy, the right treatment or therapy very early in the disease or as early as we get you, whether you're 50 or you're 20. And once we do that, can I measure that biosignature again in three months and in six months and in nine months to make sure that what I'm doing is actually having the effect that I want on you. And that is the future of MS care. And that is exceedingly exciting. Um, and it's awesome and we love it and it's so cool. And, um, and we're hopeful that, you know, this is going to be our life's work. I mean, this is kind of our focus and, and, um, and it's very exciting for us to be, you know, at the forefront of it and, and something that we're, I mean, we're proud of, but there's so much information that we want. And there's, uh, there's a lot of questions on this. So I'm going to answer some of the questions. Um, let me see. So, um, do you want me just to pick the questions at, at large uh, here, Mindy? Rainy, if we could ask, can we maybe try to answer them on the side? We are running a bit behind. Um, okay, sure. Okay. So yeah, I can do that, absolutely. Awesome, and thank you for a lovely uh, discussion. I, I hope everyone paid attention. This is really something we have desperately been looking forward to, um, to help guide us in helping you get better. So thank you for bringing everyone up today on NFL. And thank you for all the work you're doing. My pleasure. Thank you. All right.